The title of that presentation is Grout Evaluation of External PT Tendons, and our presenter is Stephen Gorn. Stephen's background is in structural engineering. Stephen has worked for six cents for six years uh, doing field testing, project management, and uh, also project development. So please help me welcome uh, Stephen. I have a uh, time here. I'll go ahead and get started. I actually have more pictures, I think, than words. And tonight at the reception, since we have a booth, I'm actually going to bring the tool there. If you have any like more in-depth questions or anything you want to take a look at it, feel free to stop by. Um, but again, uh, my name is Stephen Shorn. I've worked with Six Sense six years now, and this project, or this presentation is specifically on one of the tools we developed about seven, eight years ago with a research laboratory in Europe. And I'll briefly touch on kind of why we saw an issue to develop this kind of tool, a little bit on the technology itself, and then some of the evaluations that we've done in the field, both abroad, and then I'll finish with a recent project example that we did here in the US. Uh, so the problem, uh, of course, in this case is really geared towards external post-tensioning. The tool is specifically designed for external PT, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm pretty sure everyone here is very well aware of the, the bridge technology here. But back in the 80s in France, there were a lot of bridges that were built very quickly and with very low oversight, so they had a lot of issues with quality control. And during some inspections in the early 2000s, they found that some of the PT wasn't grouted at all, had segregated grout, major corrosion issues, and even in some cases, they went into the bridge and found that some of the PT had already broken. So we wanted to develop a method that was less subjective than hammer sounding to evaluate the quality of the grout within your PT. Again, here are just some pictures of the things that were found during the cycles of the inspections. The solution that we developed with this research laboratory is based on a principle called capacitance, which essentially every material has the ability to carry a certain amount of an electrical current. And what this tool does is send a current through the material, and based on the signal that we get back, we can characterize the material that's present or not present in this case. So after a bunch of laboratory testing and kind of field verification, we're confident that the tool specifically will tell you when there's an air void present in your post-tension duct, and also this soft grout white paste mixture. So when you have that segregation of the grout, and it's kind of like putty, it doesn't really have any structural integrity, and it also introduces potential issues for corrosion in your tendons. The inspection depth is only about an inch and a half, and in our judgment and based on experience, we know that air voids are most likely to occur on the top. So when we do the initial inspection, we run the tool along the top of the ducts. Unless we get to a certain like deviation points where we know air might be trapped underneath some of the tendons, we might do a further investigation on the lower part or do a rotation. So in this picture, you can see as we kind of go from the top section of the tendon along the side, we can do a full 360 uh, view, and we display that in the results as well, which I'll touch on in just a couple slides. Here is a 3D rendering of the tool on the left, and a picture of the tool on the right, already in place on a duct. So essentially what you have is the device itself, which is what's sitting on top of the duct. It has a distance meter in place to record your position longitudinally. And then the two straps are actually just to hold it in place. They have ball bearings on them. They don't impact the readings at all. It's just to secure the device on the duct and help you move it along it rather easily. On the bottom part of the tool, we have two, like an electrode and an anode from which the signals of a frequency oscillator are emitted and received. And then on the right is a distance meter. So again, we start at x equals zero, and then we record the distance as we travel along. So when you have the report later, you can very easily determine the location of the defects identified by the investigation. So here, we have a graph. If we were to do a 360 degree rotation around the duct, of course, you're starting at the top, which is uh, degree alpha equals zero. You would theoretically be seeing the grout or the air void there. So on this graph here, you can see on the, the top line, which is the 100 level, which is blue, that would be if the duct was completely full of air. The other line, which is kind of purplish gray in the middle, is the result we would get from the tool if 
the duct was fully grouted. So no strands in place. And then this orange line, which kind of dips a little bit towards the bottom portion of the duct during the, the rotation is a grouted cable with strands present. So after setting up a lot of different ducts and specimens within the lab, we noticed that there was some slight impact on the measured frequency when strands are located nearby. So that was all part of the calibration process to know that when we went on site and did the test, this is the, the results that we were expecting to see. So here again, this is a duct with no air voids at all. If we go to the next slide, we can see, all right, so now here's a specimen with strands in place, it's grouted, it has air void, and this soft grout mixture. So again, the line at 100, which is blue, would be if it was 100% air. I've left the yellow dotted line, which is what we had seen in the previous graph, which is what you would expect to see if it was fully grouted, but with strands present. And you can see the, the black and the red lines are the test as I do the rotation around the duct. So if I start at the top, which is the leftmost part of the graph at zero degrees, we're at the top where the air void is present. So we actually have a value not quite at 100 because it's not 100%, but we can see very clearly that we're at a place in the duct where there is an air void present. As we start to do the rotation and we get on the side and we start to encounter more strands, you can see that the measurements uh, decrease and go down more towards that yellow dashed line, which was the fully grouted with strands duct. So, and then as we go back up, we make our full 100, or sorry, full 360 degree rotation. We kind of go back up to that air voided section. So it's pretty clear when you have a voided duct versus a fully grouted duct, what the results are giving you here. And again, we set up multiple uh, specimens in the lab. And this is just one of the schematics uh, from that. But again, this was done almost nearly 10 years ago now. This is an example of the readout you get from the software. Uh, the device communicates in Bluetooth to a tough book. So here, as you're performing the test, you can see the results. So the lower sections like zone one and zone four are a fully grouted uh, portion of the duct without any air voids present. But as we start to have these spikes, like in zones three and zone six, we can tell that there's a definite air void uh, presence there. So if I were to get to a location while I'm running longitudinally along the duct where I thought there was an air void, I can do that 360 uh, rotation, which again is shown here. But we kind of translate it to a polar view to give you a representative idea of the size of your void and its location. So if you look at the circular part here, it's not to scale where the, the outer perimeter is the edge of the duct. It's just a scale here. So you can see if you follow the blue line it's pretty well grouted along the side of the duct, but we have this void towards the top right. And that gives you a good idea of the volume and the exact location. So you can do a more pointed inspection or if you need to validate that it's present, you can do a, a drill there. So a little bit more on the use itself in the field and some of the testing we had originally done abroad before I go to local. In order to test it, we need the duct to be clean. I know during a lot of grouting, sometimes it kind of gets all over the place. And those really just get in the way of the ball bearings. So generally before we ever show up on site, we have the contractor or like some non-skilled labor men go on with some putty knives, just pop off any major droplets of grout that had been left behind. I hold the sensor in the air before I even come in contact with the duct, turn it on, get a baseline measurement for the air. So that'll give me my 100% voided uh, frequency that I would expect at that location. It also helps zero it out before you start the test. After that baseline measurement has been achieved, put it onto the duct, use those two straps to kind of just hold it in place so you don't have to worry about dropping or breaking it, turn on the computer, and then you kind of just run your test. So I know in this case I show a cable stay, but it's the same principle depending if you're in a box girder or otherwise, but essentially you have the capacitive gauge or this tool which communicates via Bluetooth to a nearby computer. We use a tough book just because they're waterproof. And from there, we can further communicate to a laptop on deck if you want to display the results to someone who isn't next to you while you're doing the test. 
the tool runs on AA batteries. So this is really all you need when you're on site. You don't have to lug power equipment or recharging stations or a generator. It's just the tool and a computer. So here's an example of its use on a cable stayed bridge. So again, we're looking at the grout quality. We're not looking at the strands. So in this case, the cable stay are grouted stays. This is common more in Greece and Turkey than the US. Um, but again, here you can see we have like a rope access team to help perform the inspection. And on the upper right is just the tools you needed to bring to perform the test. And here's just another picture of the guys uh, in place. So we've, if you saw Mary Beth's presentation earlier today, this is from something I did maybe four or five years ago when we were probably still on that yellow phase of doing free demos for different agencies. And we were able to go on site. You can see the typical layout for a box girder bridge. So we have all the external tendons rather accessible. They're at different angles. We have deviation points, some really close to the ground. And we basically have to consider each situation for the best setup and how we can proceed. Uh, in this case, here's another instance where we went testing in southern France. And you can see we had to use ladders in order to reach the tendons. So each bridge has a, di a slightly different layout. We just kind of adapt, but the tool operates the same. So here in France, we were allowed to actually cut into multiple sections, and we could see very clearly where there was grout or this soft grout mixture, as well as the air voids that were present. So this coincided with what we had seen in the research lab, but it's really nice to see the same effectiveness once you're on site. So again, just some more pictures of uh, instances where we found this white paste soft grout mixture and some voids as well, where we can see there's almost no grout in these uh, pictures on the right. As far as efficiency, um, I mentioned it runs on Bluetooth and batteries, but essentially you're just walking with it in your hand, unless it's on an upper section where you can use a rope to pull. But in that sense, it's really as fast as you can walk if you can hold it and walk steadily, that's as fast as your test can go. So it's kind of hard to give an idea of how many linear feet you can get a day, but we can say about 1,300 per day. And of course, this always depends on access conditions, if I'm on a ladder, if I'm on a scaffold, and then of course, the free length of the duct. So I'll have pictures later of what I would call an inaccessible portion, where we have to take the device off, kind of move just past it, like a patch section, and then refasten it. Well, the nice part about this is those collars just pop on and off with a spring. So we're not coiling anything around it, which takes about five or 10 minutes or more to set up and take off. It's relocated in a matter of 10, 15 seconds. So here's just another example of the software. If I was going longitudinally along a duct, here it looks perfectly grouted. We're in the section where the frequency is telling me there aren't any voids. So if I were to do a 360 rotation, you could see here, in the polar view, it looks fully intact. Say I go a little bit further and we start to see this increase towards the right end where we're seeing a higher presence of air. At this third vertical red line, I'm gonna do another 360 degree rotation. And you can see as we had before, it characterizes about the volume of the void as well as the location. So this way you're not really just drilling haphazardly to find where is this where is this void? Is it really big? Is it small? It gives you a really good idea of what is going on inside of that HDPE. So moving a little bit more to a recent project example we did in the US, without mentioning the particular state because they're currently analyzing our report and deciding what to do with it. Uh, but we did this back in September to December. We evaluated 434 tendons and found an array of defects. So on the West Bridge, you can see we found about 88 sections that had significant defects, which are ones that they're strongly considering doing vacuum grouting in order to fill the voids. We have 150 sections with small voids, which we would call like a probable defect, not really worth necessarily drilling in, creating more problems, letting air in. So, I mean, this is the judgment we'll leave up to them based on what they want to do as a repair, but from my perspective, there's really a good balance between doing more damage, 
versus knowing what the current situation is and kind of being aware but letting it maybe drift off a little bit to another year or another decade. And so you can see on the East Bridge, we found similar problems. There was a, a good number of significant defects with large voids, a lot of small voids, which we can just put up to poor construction. Uh, and this they knew, which is why we were asked to go investigate the bridge. They didn't have very good plans or documentation from when the bridge was constructed. So they wanted a better idea of the current status or the current state of the structure. And here are just some pictures. So we always have to consider access. Here, it's actually only about like two feet tall, so you have to kind of crawl in and up and under, but since the equipment fits in a briefcase, that wasn't really an issue for us. And here's just some layout of the tendons. So you can see these are all freely accessible, no problem to scan these. Here, when one is really close to the ground, we can do the tests, but you would notice the bands wouldn't actually go around it. So those uh, ball bearings, which are to help us move along, we couldn't use in this case, so you're really forced to put pressure on the tool. And in that case, you're opening yourself to some air in case the tester lifts his hand up for a second. Because if those two electrodes aren't in contact with the duct and you lift it up, then you're measuring air, and that can impact the quality of your results. So in this particular case, in interest of time, we did not investigate those lower portions. We only did the ones where we could actually keep the bands in place. So here we had to use scaffold, which definitely impacted our ability to proceed quickly because we had to go up, do those sections, kind of climb down, move it. So that's why it took about two and a half, three months to do the full testing as opposed to what would normally take two or three weeks. So here are examples of locations which I would call not free length. We can't really move over this collar. So we would have to take the tool off, just put it on the other side, record that in the software to say, I missed this one foot section, just to make sure that if you're starting at x equals zero and you end at 300, you know exactly where you're finding all of these defects. And on the lower right, again, another picture. You, just, you can't make it all the way to the end because there's some obstruction there. And here's another example of an obstruction. You can tell we, just, we wouldn't be able to test that section. And judgment call for me would say if air was to start to float up here, this would probably be an area that I would see a, a good amount of defects, which is why I think they already drilled into it and did some vacuum grouting. We were able to open some of the ducts on this project. So here's an example of a smaller void, but with some loose grout. Here's an example of what I would call a, like a minor defect. So you can tell based on the size of the pen. I mean, it's rather small and it just runs along one section of the, the duct, but again, towards the top. So when we were running our first test along the top, we were able to detect this. And here is a little bit of a larger void where you have a strand that's exposed and potentially susceptible to corrosion. So this is really what you're trying to get ahead of. With other tools that look at corrosion, you're kind of out of luck if you're finding your strands are already exhibiting corrosion. So our thought process behind evaluating the grout quality and looking for the air voids was to kind of get ahead of this problem, find the locations where you're more likely to have water infiltration to cause corrosion. So ultimately, you know, what do I walk away with? Um, again, it's kind of a, an accurate localization. So when you do that 360 view, you can get an idea of where the void or that soft grout is, as well as estimate of the size for the void. And then from there, if you decide to actually uh, open the duct or do vacuum grouting, you can do a local repair before you inspect the bridge in two years and find the tendon completely snapped. Some of the advantages of the tool, I mean, it's quite unique. We developed it specifically with this research laboratory, so no one else is allowed to bring it to the market except for us. And I know there aren't very many tools out there that can detect quantitatively this soft grout presence. I mean, it's, it's still kind of an art for our guys to tell the difference between an air void and the soft grout. But based on all of the tests we've run, we have successfully identified it in multiple cases. It is sensitive and reliable. I mean, we've done extensive laboratory testing and field demos. So we've kind of produced several reports I'd be happy to share with people later if they want to look at. Uh, this is the name of the research lab that we partnered with, IFSTAR LCPC. So they are based in Paris. They have a lot of government funding there. And we have a good relationship with the government there. So we were pretty happy to work with them on this tool as well as some of our other ones. It is really fast. 
I say dozens here, but it's really hundreds of linear feet a day, depending on the access you have. Again, it's only applicable on external post tensioning or external state cables. So the limitation is that free length, which unfortunately is something I'm always asked about. I was like, oh, what about our internal PT? And there are some things to help with that, but this, this tool is definitely not, not it. So in conclusion, I can say that the e-scan, the void detector, as uh, we call it, is, I mean, it is able to identify the materials in your duct, whether it is fully grouted, uh, air voids, or a combination of the three. Uh, we have done simulations and testing to make sure that it is sensitive and accurate. Uh, our experimental measurements in all of our finite element models really have coincided and correlated with the results that we found during actual testing. Uh, we verified in the field. And it really, it's a pretty quick method to determine locations that you may want to do local repairs or a more in-depth local inspection. And normally what we would provide is a report of the locations along the duct, where the defects were, their estimated size and location, and then allow the owner or the engineer to determine the best course of action to take from there. We don't want to make recommendations on how to handle your, your structure inventory if it's going to lead to excessive costs. We don't know your situation, so we normally leave that up to, to the owner and the engineers. A couple of years ago, NCHRP mm -hmm. uh, tested several technologies, and I believe that capacitance, uh, uh, the capacitance technique was evaluated on the DAP project. Was that your company or that was uh, your competition? Or? Is this the one from Texas A&M? That is correct. Yeah, so I met with them several times yeah. with uh, Dr. Herlebaus and ultimately our tool wasn't included in the report. So the method, we, we explained the method to him and everything, but if there was a tool in that report, it's not ours. You mentioned that the dog has to be clean mm -hmm. and, you know, depending on the obstruction, but sometimes and, and many times, very often, we do have what we call wraps uh, to repair mm -hmm. uh, these dogs. So that means that you cannot access those areas neither? That's correct. Yeah, okay. when there's a wrap, it kind of skews the results. And we haven't done enough laboratory testing with those wraps to be confident in the results. So we typically skip those sections. And if you have or think of anything later, I'll be at the reception and you can always ask yeah. me there. Uh, just a quick one. I don't know if you covered it, but uh, steel uh, ducts, any, uh, is that work with your system it or does, other materials? It does not work if the duct is made of steel. Unfortunately, the signal kind of gets blocked, so we wouldn't be able to tell what's inside a steel duct. It's specifically for like HDPE. I mean, it works on PVC, but it's not really used in a structural situation, so uh, it does not work on steel. Thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.